As you've heard today, we celebrate the fact that Mary was assumed body and soul into heaven. We call it the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary into heaven. Christians both in the East and the West have celebrated this, a long tradition of celebrating this, but it wasn't until Pope Pius X, uh, uh, 12th in the 1950 defined the doctrine of the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And he also cited Mary's intimate connection with Jesus and his victory over sin and death. To understand, I suppose, the end of Mary's life, we well, should really understand her whole life together from the beginning. And from the moment of her conception by her mother and father, Saints Joachim and Saint Anne, Mary was free from sin. We call this the Immaculate Conception, that's December 8th. So the Holy Spirit was preparing from the beginning by his grace, so that Mary would be capable of welcoming the Son of God into the world. And as Gabriel, St. Gabriel, the, the angel, approached this young maiden from Nazareth and told her she was going to have a baby, and she said, yes, be it done to me according to your word. And um, this was made possible because of the faith that Mary had. Because she believed, as I do, you can too, nothing is impossible for God. So Mary sets off in the gospel today to visit her cousin Elizabeth, who also is having a baby, and, and Elizabeth's uh, older age, much older, a lot older. Elizabeth names Mary as blessed among women and defines her as the mother of my Lord. The baby in Elizabeth's womb leapt for wept, was, was very excited, leapt for joy, because that was John the Baptist who had come to prepare the way for the Lord. And how does Mary respond to the greeting from her cousin Elizabeth? She responds with a prayer. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he's looked upon his lowly servant. From this day all generations will call me blessed, the Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. So Mary, with a great prayer, gives praise to the glory of God. And she goes on to name the things he has done, God has done to raise up the lowly, things also done for us. So this must be a very typical prayer of thanksgiving for our Blessed Mother, giving thanks to the Lord and um, giving praise to God. The Magnificat, or the Canticle of Mary, is one of the most ancient of Christian hymns, and it's done at evening prayer in our churches. So, as Mary's life was formed by prayer, sustained by prayer, so must ours, our personal prayer and our communal prayer. Now, we come together here in our church for our communal prayer, our worship on Sunday, and this expresses our faith, this nourishes our faith, this increases our faith, this encourages our faith. And we also have to have time for personal prayer, quiet prayer, listening to the Lord. So we can appreciate God's presence and be in deeper communication with him. This is very important. Presence of the Lord, appreciate him, communicate him, so we can be in communion with him. And uh, Mary did this all the time. Now, in our first reading today was from the book of Revelation, and we hear about a woman, a child, and a dragon. The dragon is the evil, the power of the devil, the power of evil at work in the world. And boy, I look around the world, the devil, the evil, is uh, doing a lot of bad work. The child in the book of Revelation here is Jesus, and the woman in our reading has a double symbol. She is Mary, physical mother of Jesus Christ, and also our spiritual mother. She is the mother of the church. And um, Jesus, Jesus brings us the church and brings us this faith and the sacraments. So Mother Mary is physical mother of Jesus and our spiritual mother and mother of the church. So we really uh, have a lot to describe and be faithful for. Now, St. Francis de Sales, when giving a, a homily on, on the Assumption, said, What son would not bring his mother back to life and would not bring her into paradise after death if he could. Well, yeah, we'd like to bring our mother back and we also be in paradise with her. So in Mary's assumption, the glory of Jesus' resurrection is first of all extended to his mother, 
but also celebrate it also, because we also have a resurrection. Now, we said the assumption uh, the dogma was made in 1950. Now, if we look at the history of, of what's going on in the world at that time, we had just experienced, the world had just experienced two world wars, World War I and World War II, and the Holocaust, we did that, the atomic bomb in Japan and uh, in the 40s, uh, and the beginning of the Cold War, of the war with Russia and, and the, the Cold War with communism. So, it was a very uh, dark time in history, uh, maybe a time to feel hopeless and pessimistic. And what happens if hope comes along with this dogma, with this offering hope and, um, and um, saying really the human race is not just wars and destruction and violence and, men and, and chaos and devastation, no. The destiny of the human race is more than that. The destiny of the human race is heaven and the love of Jesus. Also around 1950, what was going on is the cult of the body and the glories of sexuality were beginning to take hold in society. And the church leaders could see that the more sex and body were allies, the more society would lose respect for marriage and family life. Church leaders could see the more that sex and body were idolized, the more society would lose respect for marriage and family life and family values. So, in contrast to the object of pleasure, the dogma of the, the assumption affirms the true dignity and beauty of the body and the source and dignity of beauty, which of course God's grace with us. Well, in the assumption of Mary, She's full reunited, of course, with her son, and um, Mary's life, as we said, was a life of prayer. And we ask our Blessed Mother, especially with the rosary, to pray for us. We ask the saints in heaven to pray for us. We ask one another to pray for us. And uh, we're sinners. Certainly the saints could do a good job praying for us, too. We seek their intersection. And, of course, we turn to the queen of all saints, God's own mother, our Blessed Mother. So the assumption tells us we're not only concerned with our own bodies our, and our souls, we're concerned about everything, our soul and body, because we are temples of the Holy Spirit. That's who we are. And the Feast of the Assumption is a feast that celebrates who we shall be. With the exception of Jesus Christ, uh, Mary is the greatest person that ever existed. She's greater than Moses or greater than Buddha or Muhammad or David or any of the great people of history. She was the one conceived without sin. She gave us life. She gave us our Savior. She is the greatest of all. And the greatest of all is a woman. Mary brought dignity to all women who have ever lived. Women bring life into the world and nurture life. And because Mary sacrificed herself for us, our women bring unique reflections of God into the world. They nurture his image with their bodies and their own lives. Women are givers. Christian women give life to the divine. Women are sources of love, carriers of love, nourishers of love. In these days, when we have a lucrative industry and pornography industry and all that kind of stuff, and many young people are exploited, Mary reminds us of the dignity and the respect that are natural rights of all women among us. And we as men should be reminded of our obligation to care and protect our women, be they little girls or teens or wives or singles or elderly or whatever. You see, we need to pray for those among us. We need to remind ourselves of the obligation to care and protect all women. These days, we also have a very glorification of ourself. We all want always about me, me, me. Mary reminds us of a person whose body and spirit were created by another. She said yes to the angel Gabriel at the Annunciation and allowed God to change her life. Wow. She supported Jesus as a young man. And uh, she stood with him at the cross when he was tortured to complete God's plan. 
she accepted uh, John. Uh, the, Jesus said to John, behold your mother. And for all this and for all more we can ever imagine, Mary was rewarded with total union with God at the conclusion of her earthly life. She was assumed into heaven. Now she's seated at the right hand. She's real close to, of course, Jesus, uh, whispering close. And uh, she brings our prayers before Jesus, and so important. She brings the prayers that we offer to honor her, especially in the rosary. She brings her prayers. We call out, Mother Mary, help us. So we tell you, pray today on the Feast of the Assumption. We pray for all our women, young and old. We pray for our brothers and sisters who are hurting. We pray for peace. We want to mention the people in, in Haiti and in the earthquakes. And we pray for ourselves. Um, and we say Mary is the mother of the church. And there's been difficulties. We have a lot of difficulties in our church. Um, and always have been, and um, the, like the devil is prowling with the secular powers and so on. And it's continued in the past, and it's continued today, and will continue in the future, and damaging. But the victory is promised. Victory and power and, and uh, forever has been won, to, uh, won for us by God and the authority of Jesus Christ. So, what happens to the church happens to all of us, of course. We, are, we have our trials and temptations, our tr failures from time to time, but we approach it with our Blessed Mother. So we lift up our hearts to Mary, Mother of God, Mother of Church, our Mother, Mother Jesus, glorious with God right now. God has given her a plan and a place, and um, we also have a plan, and there's also a place. All we have to do is be faithful and do as Mary did, which prayed prayed continually. Well, God bless you very much for listening. Hope you keep up the prayers and honor our Blessed Mother. Now, if you stand, we'll do our creed and our general decisions.